This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In our first lecture together on this chapter two, we looked at the pro forma income tax computation, as you see it here. And we saw first of all that we needed a period of time for which it would be prepared. That was the tax year, running as it does from those very strange dates, the 6th of April in one year through to the 5th of April the next year. For our particular exams running from June 23, uh, June 22, through to March 2023, we'll be looking at the 21-22 tax year. 2021-22 tax year, as we see there. And what it will principally do is to list out the income that is to be assessed in relation to that 21-22 tax year. And for most sources of income, that's an easy exercise to perform, because on most of them, we'll be looking at an actual received basis of assessment. And it shouldn't be difficult. There's a one or two problems in terms of employment income, but otherwise it's not going to be difficult in establishing what was actually received between the 6th of April 21 and the 5th of April 22. And so it was that we had a received basis in relation to our employment income that we look at in detail in Chapter 9. In terms of property income, that we look at in detail in the next chapter, chapter three. We had dividends, again, a received basis, again, dealt with, well, within this chapter in point of fact. There's not much for us to know other than, as we'll see very, very shortly, one of the main issues about uh, this particular uh, lecture, and that is how to apply the various tax rates applicable to our various sources of taxable income. But that's it, there's nothing else. We then have savings income, as we call it, i.e. our interest income, and that too, whatever form it may take, is assessed on a received basis. And again, that is dealt with within this particular chapter, apart from one tiny little bit also in Chapter 3. Trading profit was the big one. Now that's got a lot of work to do, as you will recall, I trust, in Chapter 4 and, four and 5. We'll look at how, one, we get the tax-adjusted trading profit from the starting point of the net profit as per the statement of profit or loss. We adjust it for taxation purposes, and one of the main adjustments was an add back of depreciation, but replaced, of course, by the HMRC system of giving tax relief for capital qualified capital expenditure incurred by through the form of capital allowances. And that was chapter five. How do we then relate that trading profit? to this, the tax year in which it would be assessed. Well, that required a basis of assessment. We've got a whole chapter dealing with that. The normal system is very simple for an ongoing business, but as we stated, there will be special rules, and therefore, more for you to learn, looking at what happens when a new business commences to trade, the opening years of that business, and then what happens in the closing years of a trade that ceases to trade. How do we deal with those particular problems? all of which in Chapter 6. In Chapter 7, we look at well, what happens when you sustain a trading loss. There's various things that you can do with it, none of which do you need to know now other than if you have a trading loss brought forward, given in the question into our tax year 21-22, there is but one thing that we can do with it. And that is to take it forward, bring it forward here, and set it off against the trading profit of this accounting period. If that trading loss is bigger than that trading profit, then you carry forward again. But when we look at Chapter 7, we'll see that when you sustain that trading loss, there's more than one thing that can be done with it. You don't just have to carry it forward to set it off, as you see here, against the next available future trading profit of that same trade. Instead, you can use it in either the current tax year or indeed the preceding tax year. And in various other situations, you may have the ability to carry that loss back even further, or even do other things with it, like extend what is a trading loss and put it against capital gains in your capital gains computation. But that's chapter seven. But if you do have any of those other reliefs against income, then this is where those other trading loss reliefs come in. The first exercise was to derive total income by listing those sources of income, but not just in a single straight line. Oh, no. Instead, 
analyzing by type. We had, first of all, in your first column going across the page, non-savings income. That was your income from work, i.e. employment and self-employment, but also property income. Savings income is just interest income, and dividends, well, the clue's in the name, is just dividend income. And why must we keep those separate? Why? Because as we will see in this lecture, there are differing tax rates. We said that tax, income tax, was a progressive tax, which meant, one, that as income got steadily bigger, we may move from a lower into a higher rate of taxation. Again, we'll see that in this lecture. But what will also impact on the rate of tax that is suffered on these sources of income is the type of income it is. We will see differing tax rates specifically for dividend income as compared to non-savings and savings income. And in terms of savings income, there's some special little rules there that apply in terms of a 0% starting rate or separately from that, what we'll call a nil rate band. Both of them zero and nil, giving the same effect, an amount of that interest income that will uh, be subject to a 0% rate of tax. There will be no tax there on. But again, that awaits us later in the lecture. So it's vital to know the structure of this computation. The listing exercise, the analysis exercise, firstly down to total income, then a couple of deductions. One we'll, said we'll see in Chapter 7, the other trading loss reliefs, other than the carry forward relief that is here. And also something in this chapter, qualifying interest. You borrow money, you pay interest thereon. For most of us, we borrow money to buy our house or buy a car. Well, those types of purchases do not attract tax relief in terms of the interest paid. But there are one or two examples, usually linked to business, where certain amounts of interest paid will indeed be allowable deductions against total income. Having deducted, we get to net income, and then what is usually a standard deduction of the personal allowance, as we remember for 21-22, a £12,570 figure. Not, of course, a figure that you have to remember, though you will by the time you hit the examination room anyway, but a figure that is included upon our rates and allowances page. So again, Although you don't have to remember it, you probably will. It is there on your rates and allowances. And that brings us then to taxable income. Right. How do we then proceed to tax that taxable income? Well, we said we've got the analysis columns. We put them across the page because these deductions from total income and the personal allowance deduction from our, uh, our net income they go in a very specific order for us in our exam. Firstly, against non-savings income, where you see them deducted here. But if the amount of those deductions were to exceed the amount of non-savings income, then you would go across and across again, to no from non-savings to savings to dividend income finally. OK, just a couple of more things to say in relation to our sources of income. Everything we focused on last time was taxable income. But we did mention that there's just a few, and you can see they are a few here, sources of exempt income. So what have we got? These are the ones that you need to know. Interest, or what are known as bonuses, on national savings and investment certificates. Now there, you don't know it at the moment, but as an important word in terms of a national savings and investment product, and that is certificates. It is only they that are exempt. Frequently what examiners do is to give you an account, national savings and investment account, which is like a bank, or so sort of government based, but it's like a bank and it pays interest. Well, that interest income is again accessible to income tax. It is not exempt. It is only this interest or bonuses on these national savings and investment certificates that are exempt. There's then either interest from a cash deposit or dividends from shares held within 
an individual savings account at ISA. Now we talk more about those at the end of chapter three, but basically all it is, is a product whereby you can keep cash, you can put shares into an individual savings account and either the interest and or the dividends that flow therefrom will be exempt from income tax. Now, they still exist and they're still uh, very useful for certain taxpayers, but they're not as important now as once they were in practical terms. Because as we will see in this lecture, or mostly in this lecture anyway, when we look at savings income and when we look at dividend income, as we've already mentioned on savings income, there are 0% rates of tax, a 0% starting rate of tax that may be available. There's a nil rate ban that may be available. And in dividend income, again, which may not be this lecture, but certainly very soon, we have a dividend income nil rate ban. So that income, therefore, although it comes into your computation, is not going to suffer tax other than tax at a 0% rate. So there'll be nothing to pay there. But again, still valid the circumstances in which it would be useful to invest in such ISAs. Well, we discuss that, as I say, at the end of chapter three. Now, having got that taxable income, we then need, as we said, to enter the second phase of the computation. And that is to compute firstly, and if it's the only required, then only the tax liability. But if required, we may go on from tax liability to compute an even potentially even lower figure of tax payable, i.e. there may be a deduction to go from tax liability in giving you tax payable. You may recall we briefly mentioned that again in our first lecture together. So what have we got? We said that we compute uh, firstly our taxable income, we have the analysis, we then need to produce and calculate the tax liability, which is simply the income tax on taxable income. Now, this is where, as we said, it's necessary to take each part of the taxable income in order. That order being, as now well we know, non-savings income followed by savings income. And finally then, should we have any, the dividend income. These sources are taxable, but they have, may have differing tax rates that apply to them. And rates that also change, as we said in our introduction to this lecture, depending on how much taxable income the taxpayer has. That process is basically what this particular lecture is all about, establishing that figure of tax liability. But if you have employment income, as again we mentioned in our first session, then the employers are required under the pay-as-you-earn PAYE system to deduct, in fact, both income tax and national insurance contributions of the employee at source. All the employee ends up getting from their employer is then a net pay, a net wage figure. And that net figure is after the employer has deducted on behalf of HMRC the correct relevant amount of income tax and employee NIC from that particular employee's salary or wage for that month or that week respectively. So that is an amount of tax that you paid through the tax year. Hence, that needs to be taken account of in working out what is payable, what remains as payable, if some of the liability has already been met, and for most taxpayers in the UK, probably all of their liability will have been met because the vast majority of taxpayers don't have lots of different types of investment income. They have their employment income. And if they do have little bits of interest or little bits of dividend, they are likely to be taxed at a nil rate anyway. So it is likely that for most taxpayers, then the tax payable is going to be little or nothing that remains. But we may need to compute that. So what is it? It's that tax liability less than that tax already deducted at source. This is the amount of income tax deducted at source on the employment income through the PAYE, the pay as you earn system. 
If, of course, you are required to do that, they will give you a figure of PAYE. Salaries, as normally it would be, will be quoted on a gross basis, and the PAYE will have been deducted out of that gross salary. The gross salary goes into your income tax computation as probably the major part, if not only part, of your taxable income there. And then in creating the tax bottom line tax payable figure, you deduct that PAYE figure from the tax liability. Now we look at how we tax these various types of income. Firstly, our non-savings income. Now again, don't worry in terms of the information you are about to see here. All of this is available to you on your rates and allowances pages. Again, we'll refer to those shortly. But we've got what we call the basic rate band, where up to, well, up to £37,700, the first £37,700 of your taxable income would be taxed at the basic rate of 20%. Not too bad. But then when you go over 37700 and up to, well, a rather bigger amount in this band, it steps up to the higher rate, and look what happens. Your tax rate doubles on that tax above that level of the basic rate band limit. If you go over £150,000 worth of taxable income, then it's a slightly higher rate, and that's the so-called additional rate, which is 45%. And that, as I say, is for taxable income in excess of £150,000. Now again, by the time you come to the exam, you won't need to be looking at the rates and allowances page, but that information is provided to you on that page should you need it. We know what non-savings income consists of. It is, as we've seen on the income tax comp, the trading profit, the most difficult figure to establish within your income tax computation. And that's because it is so many things to do. Uh, all the work behind it, as we've already said several times, is found within chapters four to eight. Employment income, again, another very big exercise, but it's in one big chapter, because it's all one issue. What's in the employment income? And again, as we said last time, I think, the employment income, well, for any employee, it's your salary or wage, but for the type of employee you are likely to see in an exam question anyway, it's gonna be more than just a salary or wage that is the content of the taxable employment income. There will also be benefits provided by the employer to the employee. Now, some benefits can be easily computed. It's just what the employer paid on behalf of the employee there, the cost to the employer. Others, and quite likely the ones that are most likely to be tested on you, demand rather more work from you. None more notable nor more important than the car benefits. If a motor car is provided by the employer to the employee, then there's a whole process by which we establish what the car benefit will be. And if private fuel is paid for by the employer, which routinely it will be, then there's also a separate fuel benefit to establish as well. Again, a lot of learning there, but yet again, your given fact sheets, your rates and allowances pages provided to you in the examination room there, give you most of the information that you need, which again, simplifies that area. But of course, you have to practice, as you do with all areas of taxation, but you have to practice to know how to apply those rates and allowances that are indeed given to you. And the other information, like the information about car benefits, that is provided to you. That's chapter nine there, and not such a big exercise, but still some work to be done here in relation to property income, which is to be found in chapter three. So there's our non-savings income, trading profits, employment income, property income. And we've got a nice simple little exercise for you now to carry out and do your very first tax calculation. 
Always, of course, on any example, whether it's a section A objective test and question, a section B objective test and question, or a section C written question. You have to always read very carefully and establish exactly what the requirement is. Here it is to calculate the income tax payable by Mr. Smith for the course of tax year 21-22 tax year then. It's income tax payable. That means, of course, that to differentiate between tax payable and tax liability, there must be employment income and you'll be provided with a figure of pay as you earn, P-A-Y-E, for the income tax that has been deducted at source by the employer from that salary. So what have we got here? Mr. Smith has been working for many years and received a salary of £62,500 per annum. Remember, that will be quoted gross. Salary, that is non-savings income. For 21-22, here's our PAYE figure here that had been deducted from that salary, and that was £12,000. So once we've established, once we, no, once you have established the tax liability, you'll then deduct 12000 as the PAYE figure to find what they want, which is the income tax payable. He has no other sources of taxable income. So as basic as we can get. Now we know our pro forma computation. Here we'd have analysed that there is only non-savings income. So I'm not going to ask you now as you prepare an answer to this to put both a non-savings and a total column because they are one and the same. This is what you do if you were doing an objective testing question. You're not going to be writing out information that is surplus to requirements in terms of you scoring the marks. If of course you're doing a section C question and asked to prepare the income tax computation, you do the job properly. And you'll need to do that job properly because it won't just be one source of simple employment income here. You will have the whole range of sources of taxable income, as we saw at the beginning of this lecture and all of last lecture in terms of that pro forma income tax computation. But all you've got to do here is to set up a single working whereby you've got your salary, it is non-savings, that £62,500, is that your taxable income? No, it isn't, because we get the deduction of the available personal allowance. Again, the figure provided to you on your allowance and rates page. We've mentioned it already, but it's £12,570. £12,570. Deduct it from what would be not just employment income, but is your total income. It is also your net income. Take away the personal allowance and you've got your taxable income. Now you can see that when you take 12,570 away from 62,500, that's just a fraction under 50,000. But near 50,000 is, of course, above 37,700. So all you've got to do is take the first 37,700 at the 20% basic rate. What's the remainder of your taxable income? It is in the higher rate band and tax it at the higher rate of 40%. A simple enough exercise. So over to you, therefore, if you just pause at this particular point in time, and you have a go at that, and then check out the answer in the back. The answers to these examples are at the back of these study notes. And we'll have a quick look at that together just to confirm there are no problems before we then move on to what is a much more, again, yeah, remember the pun, there's a much more interesting source of income, that is savings income, indeed the interest income. Okay, over to you, have a go at example one, please. Okay, well let's see how you fared in relation to this, uh, I hope, very simple exercise for you. Now, as I said to you, in terms of Mr Smith's income tax computation, there was no requirement for you here to put in both of these columns in terms of, we've got the employment income, which we know to be non-savings. So, of course, as it's the only source of income, both the, the total column and the non-savings income column are the same. So we've got total income of 62 and a half. Take away, as we said, the personal allowance, and you end up with taxable income of 49,930. The first thing to note there, of course, is that that income is all non-savings, 
but it is also more than £37,700, i.e. the limit of the basic rate band. So, in terms of your taxation charge, now again, remember I told you the rates and allowances information would be given to you. Uh, this is provided to you in these notes, again, just prior to Chapter 1. Again, on the uh, in terms of Roman numerals here, page 7. Uh, again, probably a good idea for you to uh, copy that off if you haven't already. And so you can use these rates and allowances without to flip back on your computer screen there as you move from one example to another. Here, as we've got it, we've got our three rates, basic, higher and additional. We've got the basic rate band limit. We've got the higher rate band limit. We've got what we call normal rates that will apply in turn to both non-savings and savings income, and then the separate dividend rates. Again, don't worry about the slightly odd numbers there in relation to those dividend rates. It gets going through a calculator anyway, and the background as to why it's a, a strange number uh, that you don't need to know. It goes back to a system that preceded uh, the one that we have now as to how dividends were assessed. And by changing what were the, then the rates to these rates, you've got effectively no change in the tax charge on the dividend income. But that's what we need to know and apply now. What we're about to see in a few minutes' time is there's a bit of extra information there about savings income. But more of that in a moment. Back to our answer, however. Yep, it's non-savings income. So it's just the basic rate band limit and what goes into higher rate. Do check the maths here. Every year I have to update these. And again, every year I press a run button on the calculator at some point and with nobody else to check these. Apologies if therefore we've got a few numerical errors. If there are, let me know through the normal medium for any questions you want to pose to me. The Ask the Tutor uh, forum there. We had... 49,930 worth of taxable income. So that means 49,930 minus the 37,700 equals, therefore, 12,230 that falls into the higher rate band at 40%. Assuming those calculations to be correct, we get our tax liability, uh, the sum total of your basic here and higher rates of tax charge on this non-savings income. We then take away, because the question asks for tax payable, the amount of PAYE deducted at source. Meaning, therefore, that that will leave, following the end of the tax year, a further £432 to be paid over by the taxpayer, here Mr Smith, to HMRC. We'll discover in an admin chapter later on, I think it's chapter 15, I think it is, that... Uh, Again, any remaining tax still to be payable has to be paid by the 31st of January following the end of the tax year. So we've got a tax year 21-22, the following 31st of January, that would be the 31st of January 23. And by that date, we must both submit our tax return and pay over the amount of income tax that remains payable, should there, of course, be any. OK. Hopefully, therefore, not uh, too many problems, if any indeed, in terms of that exercise. And what we can now turn our attention to, as we said, the more interesting form of savings income. Now, we know what it is. Savings income is interest income that uh, will be received gross, i.e. without any deduction of tax at source. Now, all interest received these days in terms of our syllabus is received that way. But again, there are certain types of interest in reality that both used to be and some still are, are received net. Nothing for you to know, or indeed what that is. We get gross amounts of interest. Where will it come from? Well, it comes from bank accounts, from building society accounts, which again, we said, you do need to know what they are. I think they are mostly a unique form of financial institution to the UK. But financial institutions that lend money for the purchase of property. They also, of course, do a whole load of other things now in terms of a full range of financial services, much like the banks also do. But any such interest, this is savings income. Plus, in terms of interest that comes in from government securities, 
or indeed any corporate bonds there, your corporate loan stock. But again, watch out for the exempt sources of interest. Noted in, well, that was 2.1 above there, as we discussed just a few minutes ago, like the interest on the ISAs, the National Savings Certificates. Those are the two types of exempt form of interest. Again, to begin with, it's simply enough. The basis of assessment is what were the actual amounts received, i.e. credited to the taxpayer on their bank account, their building society account, whatever. What were the actual amounts received there in the tax year for us 21-22, so between the 6th of April 21 and the 5th of April 22. Now, what may prove to be more interesting. Now, we've seen on the rates and allowances page that we have normal rates. And as we've said, they apply to both non-savings income, which we've already seen in that example one, but also to savings income as well. But there's going to be a couple of little additions in terms of nil rate or 0% starting rate. Again, I know we're using different terms to say the same thing. There is no tax. We're saying a 0% starting rate and a savings income nil rate band. But those are the terminologies that we must use and the way in which they will be referred to in terms of the material that you deal with, both here and should you have any other material, of course, as no doubt you will, all of you must possess uh, by the time that you end your study through these lectures and these study notes, uh, an approved exam kit, whatever they call them these days, but one of the approved ACCA providers. Again, principally there, I think the big two now are Kaplan and BPP. Whatever, the one of your choice, as long as it's approved there by the ACCA, they are the ones who are able to use the past examination questions, and that's what you need practice on. Do not go to the ACCA website for that. You'll find past questions there, but those answers and the questions have not been updated with the changes in legislation that inevitably occur from tax year to tax year. You must have the relevant exam kit for your particular examination. Do not go and buy one second hand that is an old one. You want Finance Act 2021 for the exams, as we said, from June 22 through to March 23. Make sure you use the right material, please. Right, so what do we know about calculating the tax on savings income? So our taxable interest received, as distinct from exempt income, of course, is included in the savings income column of our income tax computation. Now, of course, in the little example we did, we had just one source of income and only one deduction to come from it, the personal allowance. So it had to come away from non-savings income. But the personal allowance or other qualifying deductions from total income, any deductions in the income tax computation, the personal allowance and reliefs, the reliefs come from total income to give you net income, the personal allowance comes away from net income to give you taxable income. These deductions are for the purpose of this exam deducted firstly from non-savings income, then savings income, and finally, if there's any left over, dividend income. Hence the order, again, in which those analysis columns are listed. And again, by the time you come to an exam question, indeed, very soon in terms of this chapter, you'll be seeing it, where we've got all different types of income. We have got both non-savings in its different forms, savings income and dividend income. We've got a personal allowance. We may have some qualifying loan interest to deduct from total income to give you net income. And we've got to put that all together in income tax computation and then ensure that we apply the correct rates of tax firstly to non-savings, then to savings, and finally down to the dividend income figure. So that's the practice we're going to need here once we've instilled these rules uh, in our heads. Non-savings income, as we have repeatedly said, is treated as the first slice of taxable income to be taxed followed by savings income 
and then finally dividend income. Remember, dividend income, we'll see it later, but that's got its own separate tax rates. The total of this is the tax liability of the taxpayer. As you saw in example one, take away any tax deducted as source through PAYE from the liability to give you, if required, the tax payable. Only do what you're required to do in relation to the requirement of the examination question. In terms of our non-savings income, our tax rates are as we have seen and as are given to you on your rates and allowances pages. We've been through those. There's nothing new there. As we persistently punned here, the taxation of savings income is indeed more interesting due to the introduction, as goes back some years ago, of a nil rate band. So when you've got your taxable income and savings income with, is within it, there may be available a savings income nil rate band. Now I say may because the amount of that band and whether it is available at all is a function of the level of taxpayer you are, i.e. are you just a basic rate taxpayer or have you moved into higher rate tax or have you moved further into additional rate? So what are the rules here? This savings income nil rate band, £1,000 for basic rate taxpayers. £500 for higher rate taxpayers and additional rate taxpayers, there's not any savings income nil rate band at all. Now again, through practice, you'll come to know that, but I think if we go, yeah, we've got this information here in relation to the rates and allowances. The savings income nil rate bands, £1,000 for a basic rate taxpayer and £500 for a higher rate taxpayer there. You have to remember that additional rate doesn't get anything at all. Back to the note. The savings income nil rate band, if there is one, a 1000 or £500 as the case may be, counts towards the basic rate and higher rate thresholds. So we know that we've got a rate, basic rate band limit of £37,700. We know that we compute to tax firstly on non-savings income. It is the first slice of our taxable income. And then we move to tax the savings income. Now then, there is, as we'll talk about in a moment, a 0% starting rate. If that was available, it would apply first. But if as routinely it won't be available, for reasons as we'll see, then you've got your savings income nil rate band. Now that is a part of the £37,700 worth of basic rate band limit. So if you've got £30,000 worth of taxable non-savings income, it's all in the basic rate band. It doesn't exceed £37,700. So it's all therefore going to be at your set level of, of course, 20%. If you then got £10,000 worth of savings income, 30 plus 10, that 10 is going to take you through the remaining basic rate band and up into higher rate. Now, if you are a higher rate taxpayer, which £40,000 of taxable income routinely means, you are a higher rate taxpayer, then it means that you would be entitled to a £500, as we have seen here, a £500 savings income nil rate bound. So the first £500 of your £10,000 of taxable savings income would be at the nil rate. So that means that you'd have taxed 30000 non-savings income at 20%, you then have a £500 savings income nil rate band. Why £500? Because with the inclusion of £10,000 in total of savings income, 30 plus 10 is 40. 40 exceeds 37.7, and therefore you are a higher rate taxpayer. Therefore you get £500 as your savings income nil rate band. 
So you've written 30,000 at 20% for non-savings. You now come to savings and you have got the first 500 at the nil rate. So that means you've now accounted for £30,500 of your taxable income. And what this point means, the savings income nil rate band, counts towards the basic rate and higher rate threshold. So with the basic rate band limit of 37700 and you've already taxed at 20 and at nil rate, 30,500. Then you've got to take 37.7 minus 30,500. So 37.7 minus 30,500 would leave you with 7,200 pounds worth of remaining basic rate band. So when you tax, as we'll see in examples in a moment time, don't worry. When you tax the remainder of your savings income, then you've only got some 7,200, not 7,700 pounds worth of remaining basic rate band. And that pushes, therefore, the rest of that income up into the higher rate. A higher rate, whereas we know, whether it's non-savings or savings, is going to be 40% tax charge. Now, as I say, we'll see that point illustrated when we do further examples, but I hope you picked up on what that statement means. Now, it does say there that it supplements a 0% starting rate of tax that is, however, only available to taxable savings income that falls within the first 5,000 of taxable income. Now, that is going to need some explaining. But first of all, on your rates and allowances, this is what you're told in the exam room. Starting rate of 0% applies to taxable savings income where it falls within the first £5,000 of your overall taxable income there. So that is given to you. Now again, I would hope by the time you hit the exam room, you're going to know this well. But to begin with, this is often a little issue that students find difficult and how to combine a potential uh, double act in terms of nil rates or 0% rates, a starting rate of 0%, and then this a savings income nil rate band that could be a 1,000 or it could be 500, or it might not be anything at all. Okay, we'll illustrate that with examples. Now, here, a little example I've set up for you. Just again, a very simple one. And again, similar to what I've just said there. What we have is non-savings income, so here a salary of £30,000, like I said a moment ago. We've then got bank deposit interest of £10,000. So when you read in the question that the taxpayer has the following sources of income, salary £30,000, bank deposit interest £10,000, you know that that is non-savings for the salary and the interest is savings income. Check out that there's no more information about any other income, like dividend income. So you know you only need two analysis columns, which we have, and then you need a total column. Anything that goes into an analysis column, your salary of 30,000 on savings, anything in an analysis column goes into your total column. Your bank deposit interest is savings income, 10,000, into your total column. So what have we got? Our total income is £40,000 there, made up, as we can clearly see, of £30,000 of employment income, your salary, and £10,000 of bank deposit interest. We then take away the personal allowance. Now, here, I've said, of course, these are the income figures as opposed to the taxable income figures that I used in my oral explanation of the savings income nil rate band and a mention of the, uh, well, just the savings income nil rate band really. But here, 30,000 salary, 10,000 interest, i.e. savings income. Where does the personal allowance go? Firstly, against your non-savings income. The non-savings income is a lot more than the personal allowance available, and it leaves you, therefore, with a taxable income figure of £17,430. That will still leave £10,000 of savings income 
And in total, again, if I've got my maths right anyway, some £27,430 of taxable income, total taxable income. Now, in the descriptive example, the oral example I gave to you a moment ago, you had £40,000 of taxable income. That meant you were a higher rate taxpayer. Remember, taxable income is after deducting your personal allowance. Here I've given you the income figures, and you've got 40,000 of total income, not taxable income. Therefore, take away your personal allowance from non-savings before savings. Get your taxable income figures. What is that figure? It is less than, what's the number I'm thinking of? 37,700. You are a basic rate tax payer. How do you therefore tax that? You tax your non-savings income, first of all, that is £17,430. All of our income, we know, is within the basic rate band anyway, so that will be ta taxed at 20%. You've then got your savings income to deal with, £10,000 of it. We know we're a basic rate taxpayer. What, therefore, does a basic rate taxpayer get? You get a savings income nil rate band of £1,000. So £1,000 at nil, the nil savings income nil rate band. That leaves the remaining £9,000. Now we know that we've got this total of 27430 here. We're a basic rate taxpayer. So, of course, all of that 9,000 remains within the basic rate. What is the basic rate band? It is 20%. And you would then be able to calculate your figures there on. You can do the numbers on that. And that would give you your tax liability. If they'd wanted tax payable, they'd have had to have told you the PAYE figure applicable to your salary, your employment income. Here, there was £30,000 of such employment income. But our tax liability would be a combination of those three figures there. That would be your tax liability job done. So there, in that exercise, because the taxable income did not exceed 37.7, the savings income nil rate band was £1,000. If that figure, as in my oral example of a few minutes back, had been 40,000, that would mean that you were talking in terms of a higher rate taxpayer, and therefore this figure would only be 500. But you would include that in this calculation, in this column as you see here, and that 500 would therefore use up 500 of the otherwise available basic rate band of 37,700. You would then proceed to tax the remainder of your income at the relevant basic and higher rates. Okay, now there we've just looked at the savings income nil rate band. We have not to worry about the starting rate. If I take you back to your notes, and we just look through to example two. I want you to have a go at this, where, again, it's a simple example in terms of the content. We just want an income tax liability for, of course, our 21-22 tax year. We've got a source of non-savings income. Always recognise within the question the types of income you're dealing with. Trading properties, non-savings. 27,500. Bank deposit interest, 10,000. That is savings income. We can see that that 27 and a half and 10, 37,500. Remember, we're not comparing that with the 37,700 basic rate band limit because this is just our total income. You know that away from that non savings income, you will deduct the personal allowance. 
and that will still give you a significant amount of trading profit falling within the basic rate band and therefore to be taxed at your, again as we know, 20% rate. All of this 10,000 of savings income will remain within the basic rate band, but because you are a basic rate taxpayer, as we have just seen a moment ago, that's a thousand pounds dividend, so a thousand pounds savings income nil rate band available. I'd like you please to have a go at that example now and then check it out with the answer. And when I come back to you, we'll go through that quickly, that answer together before progressing on. Okay, let's see how you got on and hopefully you are flushed with the success at this particular point in time. But what would we, did we identify from the question? Our approach to the question is critical. As we read through it, we didn't just read it as a story. It's not, again, these tax questions are not usually interesting stories. You won't find much sex or violence contained within a tax question, I assure you. So what you're after is on a first run through, making sure that you've picked up all the relevant information in terms of the answer that you will be required to prepare i.e. you read that there was trading income. You knew that to be non-savings. There was bank deposit interest. You knew that to be savings income. Now, of course, these are just the basic beginnings. There will be much more information contained within a Section C written question. But a Section A objective testing question would have told you this. OK. So we list them out. We've used our total column here. Your personal allowance, it is deducted firstly from non-savings income. There is again more than sufficient non-savings income to fully cover the personal allowance and still leave us with non-savings taxable income of 14,930. Non-savings taxable income of 14,930. We've got £10,000 of taxable savings income also then to compute. We can see that we are but a basic rate taxpayer. We need to know that, of course, because wherever there is savings income, we must consider at this point the available savings income nil rate band. Basic rate taxpayer. Therefore, it's the full £1,000. We then proceed to tax as ever. Firstly, non-savings, all of the 14,930 at 20%. On to savings income, basic rate taxpayer, 1,000% the nil rate band, and the remaining 9,000 all, of course, within the basic rate band at 20%. And in that way, establish your tax liability figure. Just check the numbers on that, make sure they're okay. Billy is a basic rate taxpayer, so his savings income nil rate band is £1,000. Now, as I just discussed there that answer, that there was no need to make reference to the so-called 0% starting rate, which you are still to find out about. But it says here, the 0% starting rate for savings income is not applicable as non-savings taxable income, remember that was 14,930, exceeds 5,000 pounds, exceeds 5,000. Now, you were told here, and I'll be going through this in full with you in our next lecture together, that a starting rate of 0%, starting rate, taxable savings income, where it falls within the first £5,000 of taxable income, within the first £5,000 of taxable income. Now, what is the first taxable income to be taxed? As we have seen, oops, as we have seen, it is your non-savings income. And what that means is that that figure at 14930 covers the first £5,000 of taxable income. So none of your savings income falls into the first £5,000 of savings, sorry, of taxable income. All of the first 5000 of taxable income 
as seen there, 14, 9, 30, is none's savings. So none of the first £5,000 of taxable income is savings income. On that basis, the 0% starting rate bound is not available to you. This figure here, 14,930, the taxable amount of non-savings income, that figure would have to be less than £5,000 for the 0% starting rate then to apply on the next to be taxed figure of savings income. But that, again, I will discuss with you next time. But before next time, what I'd like uh, you to do here, please, is example three, where again you deal with Billy, but you recalculate Billy's income tax liability, assuming this time that the bank deposit interest is now 25,000. Hmm, a bigger number. I wonder what that will do to the type of taxpayer that Billy has now become and the impact that that will have of the available savings income nil rate band. Over to you. I'll deal with that with you at the start of the next lecture before then going on to go through again and illustrate with examples how and where the 0% starting rate applies. Look forward to seeing you then.